and welcome to Ag PhD. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for joining us today. Darren and I get a lot of questions about humic acid and fulvic acid. So today we want to talk a little bit about both and just some of the differences we see between the two. We'll also talk about soybean diseases. Depending on where you're at across the country, there are different diseases that will hit different areas. But there are quite a few that are out there right now. We'll show you how to protect your crop. Coming up later in the show, we have an Iron Talk and a Weed of the Week as well. But first, here's this week's Farm Basics. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the end zone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. The end zone monitors outside conditions to run your fans so your grain naturally reaches ideal temperature and humidity. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. During our Farm Basics time today, we're going to talk a little about soils. In particular, soil pH and how that affects nutrient availability for crops. Well, it's fun this spring and early summer is getting soil tests from across the country and in different situations. Now, for example, one of the things that we saw was low micronutrient availability and one of them in particular was manganese. Whenever we would see a 7 pH or higher especially, or even some of the upper 6s, we saw lower levels of manganese on many of the tests. And when we saw lower soil pHs, like low 6s, upper 5s, we saw higher availability of manganese. Do you see a correlation here with soil pH and potential nutrient tie -up? All right, I want to give you a very specific example with one of the primary nutrients, phosphorus. What happens with phosphorus is it's usually in the phosphate form, and in high pH soils, there's typically excess calcium. Well, calcium can bind with phosphate to form calcium phosphate, which unfortunately is insoluble in water. When it doesn't dissolve in water, that means the plant can't bring it in. It's not in a form the plant can use. So it's all because the soil pH gets so high and then we start seeing that excess in calcium and the binding with phosphate. Now the same thing can happen with phosphorus when we get to the low pH. So that calcium thing happens predominantly in the 7.5 to 8.5 range for pH. When the pH is low, let's say it's down in the 5s, we'll commonly see phosphate binding with iron. When the pH is down in the 4s, we commonly see phosphate binding with aluminum. Well in either case, there's phosphorus in the soil. But unfortunately, it's binding with another nutrient, so the plants can't get it and use it. That's a real problem. By simply getting the soil pH in the appropriate range, let's say around 6, 6.5, six 7, somewhere in that range, phosphorus becomes a lot more available than it is when the pH is too low or too high. Now, if your pH is too low, one of the easiest ways to raise that pH up is by applying calcium carbonate. This is something that could be used in your lawn, it could be used in fields, certainly could be used in gardens as well. One spot in particular I'll point out for your lawn is if you have a dog and that dog does his thing out in your yard and you have little spots in your yard that are dying. The cure for that is lime. It's calcium carbonate. Raising the pH up can fix that problem because what the dog left behind was very acidic. So acid is the key if you wanted to lower a high pH. In fields, we usually talk about improving drainage to flush salts out. Generally speaking, when we have more salts and more sodium, that pH starts to climb. That can be a real problem. Of course, improving that drainage is important. And then one thing that you could apply in high pH situations in many cases is elemental sulfur. That can help form sulfuric acid in your soil and lower that pH back down. Well, once again, the pH of the soil has an enormous impact on availability of nutrients. I gave you the example of phosphate in low pH, high pH, and neutral pH, but the same types of things can happen with just about any nutrient out there. So as farmers, and for that matter, if you have a garden or a lawn, whatever, you want to try to get that soil pH around that 6 to 7 range for most crops, most lawns, most situations. But I will say there are certain crops, they prefer a little bit lower pH, others like a little higher pH, and that's one of the things we commonly talk with farmers about. Well, unfortunately, I don't think soil pH is going to have a whole lot to do with controlling our weed of the week. We'll show you what will stop this weed later in the show. Where we have run the soil warrior, we have harvested the best corn we have ever harvested in the history of Renwood Farms. 
Now, I'm kind of always wanting to push the envelope to see what else I can do to help enhance that emergence. Their ride is so much smoother. Their seed placement is even better. Where we had our best emergence and we've had our best yields was where we ran the soil warrior. Stop losing money from your stored grain with the Enzone fan control system from Farm Shop MFG. The Enzone monitors outside conditions to run your fans so your grain naturally reaches ideal temperature and humidity. For more information, visit farmshopmfg.com. Keep your equipment in the field when you need it most with parts from Titan Machinery. We carry a full line of high quality Case IH parts designed for optimal performance and durability. We also carry alternative parts options at lower price points with rugged designs for a great mix of affordability and performance to fit a wide variety of makes and models. Contact your local Titan Machinery location today or shop online at www.titanmachinery.com. Titan Machinery, your local Case IH parts leader. Pentair Hypro 3D nozzles are your premier choice for fungicide applications. Syngenta fungicide application field trials have shown Hypro 3D nozzles provide a yield advantage of up to 10% over other nozzles, maximizing the return on your fungicide investment. Learn more at pentair.com slash hypro. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm and use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. There's a lot of talk in agriculture about humic and fulvic acids. They're organic acids that are naturally out there in your fields. But what if we we're using those products in different ways? Could we get more gain from our crop? We're gonna discuss this today. Okay, so I even put together a little list here of some of the things that people will talk about with humic and fulvic acids and some of the benefits that, that get described. So just real quick, reduce water and nutrient loss in low CEC soils, improve aeration and tilth in tight heavy soils, increase soil aggregation, increase soil water holding capacity, make the soil a little darker color which increases sunlight absorption, you can regulate pH value of soils, improve nutrient and water uptake, increase the buffering properties of soil. There are a whole bunch of benefits or at least potential benefits that could come out of humic and fulvic acid so when you hear this you probably go well this sounds like the greatest stuff in the history of the world i got to use this on every acre well it may or may not fit in your operation so what we really want to focus on here is where are we seeing gains and where have we not necessarily seen as much all right let's start with planting time and when you think about the planter there's a lot more going on than just dropping seed in the ground often there are natural or biological products like bacteria and beneficial fungi being applied and there's also fertility going out now when you think about soil applied fertility activating the biology around that fertility to help bring it into the plant in a usable form is really important. Humic acid is one of those substances that has been used for many years in this capacity. Putting it right with those in furrow applications gives you an opportunity to have it in a concentrated spot where it can do the most benefit for you for the least amount of cost. Now let me say this, when we talk about humic acid, inside that is fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is a smaller molecule, but typically when you're getting humic, you're getting humic plus fulvic. When you're getting fulvic acid, you are just getting fulvic, so the smaller molecule, not the bigger molecule. With that small molecule of fulvic, that can typically penetrate cells better, that can help bring nutrients in a little bit better, so a lot of times we'll talk to high yield farmers and they say, make sure that you put fulvic acid together with your foliar nutrients, and that's something we've started doing ourselves and seen a little bit better response that way. So when Darren says throw humic out there, you absolutely can. But humic is more of a soil conditioner, and if we separate out the portion that's just the fulvic, that's usually the component where we say, all right, we're going to put that together with fertilizer to help get more things into the plant, either foliar or in furrow. We may be wondering, are your soils going to be improved by using something like humic acid? And 
it is a little bit of a, a hit and miss thing where in some areas if soils are just perfect and everything's great and the soil health is fantastic and soil pH is ideal, nutrient content is high, you may not see as much gain out of humic acid. For example, if you've got already three or four or five percent organic matter out there in a very healthy, well-balanced soil, it may not provide you a huge gain. However, maybe you have some heavy soils, but there are a lot of challenges. We especially see this in the north. When we look at poorly drained, heavy soils, they're cold, and soil health in general is not quite as good, we're seeing some big benefits in many cases from using a humic acid application at planting time. So what Darren's talking about is our specific research on this in, in multi-states and where we have seen the better response is the more challenging soils. But again, like what Darren said, if your soil is absolutely perfect, your, your organic matter is five, you've got your phosphorus built up, your potassium built up, your pH is absolutely right, you're already getting 250, 280 bushel corn, chances are you're not going to see the same kind of return. I'm not saying you shouldn't use the product, but where we've seen the very best gains out of humic acid is on the tough soils. Well, one of the challenges here though too, Brian, for farmers trying to pick out the right humic acid product is there really isn't a standardized way for humics to be measured. Oftentimes it's based on color. Well, it's a little darker, so it must be a little more humic or something like that, and that, that's really tough. I love chemistry where we know, all right, there's this percentage of glyphosate in the tank and we know exactly what we're getting. When it's a humic acid product, there isn't that scale to measure things by. So you do have to do a little bit of research as to which products are working, which ones are showing a better benefit. Yep, I agree with that 100%. So our whole point here is don't get sucked in by snake oil. There are going to be some people selling very inferior humic acid products, fulvic acid products, and because there's no standard in the industry, because there's nothing you can exactly look at on the label, it's gonna to be tough to sort that out. So I, I wish we could just tell you, yep, buy this product or do this thing or look for this particular ingredient. It's just unfortunately not super simple with humic acid and fulvic acid. So again, we just wanna leave you with this. Humic and fulvics definitely can have some benefits. We look at humic as more of a soil conditioner. We look at the fulvic portion of humic, if you can buy that separately, to go together with fertilizer, either in fur or foliar, and we are seeing some gains in all these cases, but we're seeing more gains where we have tougher soil conditions to deal with. Well, one thing that can be a problem for you, whether your soils are tougher or better, is weed pressure, and our Weed of the Week is certainly a tough one to control. We'll show you how to stop it later in the show. Introducing the all-new Diamant Cornhead from Capello USA. With a revolutionary design highly innovative for its class, we have painstakingly designed every component down to the smallest detail to maximize your harvest efficiency. This gives you unprecedented standards in operation and performance. For more information about this beast, available only in our new gray poly, call 855-CAPELLO or visit capellousa.com to find a dealer near you. Capello, wherever you are, we are. Find love and then give it all away. And give it all away. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. When you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line. Then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation, how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. 
is the time of year, unfortunately, where we start getting a lot of questions about soybean diseases. Well, Darren is out in the fields a lot more than I am. He's the soybean expert. So Darren, I'm gonna quiz you real quick. Just give me your top, maybe a couple points on each one of these different diseases. Let's start with frog eye leaf spot. Well, first of all, frog eye has moved further north in our country each of the last few years. We're seeing frog eye now up into the Dakotas. Frog eye is one that could be there from here on out for the rest of the season. So it's not a, well, I'll just spray one time and I'll protect against it. You may be using multiple applications to stop frog eye. What you wanna do though, if you have this year in and year out, is select a variety with more tolerance. Yield damage. Is this the worst one? It's pretty big. It's a pretty big one. And there's been some resistance to some of the fungicides too, like the strobes, for example. So yeah, it, it's one that can take a lot off the top end. Okay, uh, the one I think is the worst is sclerotinia white mold. What are your top couple of points with that? Spray early and often for this one because it's going to start with the first bloom. And every time that plant is under stress, and we have the right conditions in terms of some moisture. This is a fungus, so think about if a mushroom could grow out there, what conditions does it need? It needs some shade, it needs a little bit cooler weather, and it needs a little bit of moisture. So if you're 95 or 100 degrees and dry every day, probably not gonna be a problem for you, but if you're in the 70 to 80 range for temperature and you're getting plenty of moisture and you've got a full crop canopy, watch out. Let's move to some diseases that don't hurt yield maybe quite as much as those first two, but still could be really harmful, pod and stem blight. Well, pod and stem blight is one that pops up later in the season. A lot of times we'll see this after we have uh, pods starting to develop. So it's one where if you're using a fungicide program, many farms are done by R2, R3, that's full bloom to first pod. You're gonna need to spray after that if you want protection from pod and stem blight. All right, a couple late season diseases, Cercospora and Anthracnose. Well, again, let's take them one at a time. So Cercospora, the leaves are gonna look almost leather-like. So there's, there's kind of a different look to those leaves when you have Cercospora. And this is the one that can cause purple stain on the seeds. So if you're raising production seed, for example, you don't wanna see any of it, not even a tiny little bit out there. It can make your seed look terrible and be completely undesirable. But even if you're not raising your soybeans for seed, it's one you're gonna to wanna to stop and fungicide can be very helpful. Anthracnose? Anthracnose is another one of the late season diseases, often like pod and stem blight. You're going to see this later on. So if you're spraying again at that R2, R3 stage, you're gonna to have to do another application later. Now, of these diseases, again, frog eye, white mold, probably pod and stem blight. I don't care what your yield is, all of those diseases could really, really hurt you, so you gotta spray. With the other ones, brown spot, cercospora, anthracnose, you know, if you're down in the 30, 40 bushel range, I don't know that it's gonna be worth it for you to spray in a lot of cases, but if you're pushing for higher yields, 60, 70, 80 plus, then I think it's gonna be worth treating. The good news with all these diseases is they're fungal. So you can use fungicides. Darren, you have any guidelines there or well, any, the big, any favorites? The big thing is you have to use multiple modes of action because some of these diseases like frog eye, for example, are resistant to the strobes. That would be products like headline and quadris. Well, those are very popular ones. So make sure you're using at least a two mode of action, if not three mode of action product, so you're going to cover yourself. Chances are there's more than one disease happening out in your field make sure you're covering yourself with multiple modes of action. Yep, so I would say if you're after white mold, start with Cobra right before flowering. I mean like right before flowering. At R1, you can start spraying any of the fungicides and you'll see some benefit on a lot of these diseases, but especially white mold and frog eye fairly early. Then you can spray again two, three weeks later, again, two, three weeks later, you literally could go out there three different times with fungicide if you had all these diseases, both on the early side and on the late side. Well, there's certainly a lot of products to choose from and a lot of timings that you could be going out there with. The other thing that I'd say to keep in mind is you're only gonna protect the foliage that's out. So if your plants are still growing taller, any new growth is unprotected. So once you see a substantial amount of new growth, you wanna get another application out there if you're still in that disease window. My last thing I will point out, don't think you're gonna scout for diseases. You can't scout for diseases. What you have to do is say, hey, do I have conditions where this is conducive for this disease? And then you have to spray in advance. That's the only way you're gonna stop these things. Once you've seen them, the yield's already lost. You're too late. Well, it's too bad that disease problems don't just wipe out our weed of the week so we don't have to go out and pull it or spray it. We'll show you how to stop this weed coming up next.
The Weed of the Week is brought to you by Corteva AgriScience, Agriculture Division of Dow DuPont. Finish the fight against tough weeds with the Enlist Weed Control System. Weeds are tough. But we're tougher. With unrivaled weed control. Reduced drift. And near zero volatility. So, who's tough now? <laughs> is just an annual weed, but for Darren and me, we have vivid memories of this particular weed. It is wild mustard. From when we were growing up, we used to have to go pull this weed. Well, especially if you look at alfalfa or small grain crops, and we had both of those on our farm. If you saw some mustard out there, our dad's favorite thing was, you know, I really don't want to spray the whole field, but you boys could go out and just hand pull them. That would be just fine. And you know what? That method still works today. So if you want to go out and hand pull wild mustard, well, you certainly can. They're annual weeds. So you can do that. You can get the root system and everything, no problem. You can kill the weed that way, but it is a lot of work. And they're small plants, and oftentimes a patch from the road looks like, oh, there's probably 10 or 12 weeds out there, and there might be 60. And the problem with that is if you've got 60 weeds out there, Heck, even if you have 10, you have lost a little bit of yield in that pocket and it's easy for that weed to spread. So let's talk about control methods. We typically have the most issue with wild mustard in small grains. So with wheat especially, we have plenty of options now. We would suggest that you start with Sharpen pre-emerge. If you want to use Prepare, you certainly can. Prepare is not going to be as good. That's an ALS. Sharpen is a PPO and it is excellent on wild mustard. Post-emerging wheat, this is where product selection becomes important because Wide Match is not my first choice on this one because it has Stinger in it, and Stinger is actually labeled in the crop mustard. So if you're going to be using Wide Match and you say, I really need it for Canada thistle and kochia, that's fine, but if you've also got some mustard out there, tank mix in something like one of the Affinity products that'll really help you, or you could just switch to Husky. That would be a better choice for wild mustard. All right, when we get to corn, this isn't a real big problem, but our first choice pre-emerge would probably be Verdict. Post-emerge, I really like status, but any of the HPPDs, uh, especially when you put them along with just a little bit of atrazine, they're gonna do a good job as well. And soybeans are three pre-programmed with Metribuzin in it, and one of the PPOs, either Valor or Authority, along with one of the yellows, that's an excellent program to start with. Post-emerge, if you've got one of the herbicide tolerant crops like an Extend or an Enlist, you've got the Dicamba or the 2,4-D options there. Of course, Roundup will work, Liberty will work, and then in conventional soybeans, you may use something like a Pursuit Flexstar combination that does pretty well. Yep, so there are a lot of options. Many of these options, unfortunately, though, came out after Darren and I were kids. So we had to go pull this particular weed. Well, and they've come down mustard. in price, too, yeah. Brian. They aren't as expensive as those things used to be back then. Yep, that's a good point. All the herbicides are a lot cheaper today. Well, again, our Weed of the Week is Wild Mustard. That's it for this week's weed. But stay tuned, Iron Talk is coming up next. Success isn't just about maintaining your operation how you make out for the season, or how much you can get from each acre. It's about doing precisely what needs to be done to feed your crop and grow your legacy, all the way down to the last drop. AgroLiquid Precision Crop Nutrition. Apply less, expect more. Find a retailer at agroliquid.com. How much does your crop residue cost you? Over time, residue accumulates in your fields, building excess carbon levels and tying up your plant available nitrogen. Residue also traps P, K, and micros and can take years to naturally become available to your crops. This is because soil lacks the diverse microbial life needed to break it all down. With Decomp, you can naturally restore life to your soil and allow the release of valuable crop fertility. Learn more about Decomp at eggbio.solutions. If you're looking to expand your farm's grain handling, you want everything to be fast and efficient. 
The Quick Belt from Norwood Sales is your all-around grain handling solution. Our conveyor-based system uses an 18-inch belt in a 10-inch tube, which minimizes seed damage while moving more than 10,000 bushels an hour. That's fast enough to fill a semi in six minutes. Plus, our hood is designed to gently direct the flow of grain straight down, keeping your crop in condition. Keep your grain and your farm moving with the Quick Belt from Norwood Sales. How much money are you leaving in the bin? If you want the most profit from your stored grain, you need the Grain Temp Guard from Farm Shop MFG. This low cost bin monitoring solution tracks temperature and humidity and gets your grain in ideal condition. And with deep preseason discounts on all Grain Temp Guard units, now is the best time to upgrade. Don't leave your money out in the bin, get the most from your grain. Order today at farmshopmfg.com. More choices, more money. With Bayer Plus Rewards, you choose from our broad portfolio of high-performance products. Earn more money on the eligible products that are right for your farm. And use our new portal to see your purchases, track your rewards, and decide how you want to use them. Visit MyBayerPlus.com to sign in and start earning. That's the advantage of more control in your hands. That's the plus. Iron Talk is brought to you by Case IH. Why do I farm? It's just something I've always wanted to do. Something I've known since I was my daughter's age. When you farm, you have a responsibility to keep it growing. To look at a freshly planted field, a newborn calf, even your bottom line. Then ask yourself, how do I help this grow? How can I make it even more productive? I ask myself these questions every day. Because no matter what I'm doing, I'm still a farmer. Corn crop is getting tall and time is running out for side dress or late season fertilizer applications for many growing areas. If you're still planning to get out there with fertilizer on your farm or you're thinking about a later season fertility application for next year, here's one big consideration you should have regardless of the crop that you're raising. I'll discuss it in today's Iron Talk. If previous generations on your farm had access to the equipment that you have today, chances are they would have done things a lot differently. Case in point, there's some great equipment available for late application of fertilizer in crops. Also, satellite imagery, drones, and plant tissue testing are becoming more widely used all the time, so the awareness is growing as to what nutrients our crops need and what they may be short in. However, just because a crop is short in something and you can actually apply that nutrient to the field doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get into the plant in time to save this year's yield. One great example lies with potassium fertilization. As yields continue to go up, the demand for nutrients like potassium, especially during flowering and soybeans, is getting greater. However, if you're significantly short in potassium and wanted to apply it around the time your beans are flowering to fill pods and improve yield, can you get it into the plants? Well, if soil texture is light and sandy and you have plentiful irrigation to move the potassium down into the soil, you may well be able to accomplish this and feed the crop. If you have heavy soils and no irrigation, though, the chance of surface applied potassium getting into the crop through the root system is pretty slim. Nutrients like nitrogen move in the soil well, and nitrogen has been used successfully in late applications for a long time. Nutrients like potassium, though, move very little in heavy soils. So rather than broadcasting a dry product, your best shot to actually get some K into the plants would be foliar feeding with something like SureK. Again, if you want to push additional nutrition into your crops later in the season, there are some great ways to get fertilizer out there that previous generations of farmers never had access to. Just check with a knowledgeable agronomist about which types of fertilizer could actually help your crop this year. That's all for today's Iron Talk, and now back to the show. That's all the time we have for today's show, but before we go, we just want to let you know that if you have any agronomic questions, you can send them to us at radio at agphd.com. We will typically answer those each day during our Ag PhD mailbag segment of the Ag PhD radio show. It's on Sirius XM channel 147 at 2 p.m. Central each weekday. And don't miss the next Ag PhD TV show. We'll have another Weed of the Week, Farm Basics, Iron Talk, and a whole lot more. I'm Darren Hefty. And I'm Brian Hefty. Thanks for watching Ag PhD.